It's been nearly two years since the premiere of season one of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time before the second season airs to revisit season one and refresh my memory a little bit. Now, I did end up publishing a review after taking a few months to reflect on season one, but as we head into season two this week, I wanted to do a more careful reassessment of season one. Now, this is mostly because it just sounded fun to do a careful rewatch, but I also wanted to do so because I wanted to create some sort of very specific numerical grading system so that I could compare my thoughts of season one to season two without really being affected by season two as we're looking back on season one. If you'd like to watch my initial season one review, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Some of my feelings have changed over the years, which is also another reason I'm looking forward to this reassessment. I do also want to add at the beginning of this video that I'm not a professional critic. I'm just a really big Tolkien fan and a really big fan of the show. And these are just my own opinions. So that's fine if you disagree with me. I really don't mind. But I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. So these are the areas on which I will be grading each episode. The first and most important is, of course, Tolkienian core and themes. This category is weighted 20, where all of the other categories are rated 10s. Questions I'm asking myself when watching these episodes. Does this feel like Tolkien? Does this series align with major Tolkienian themes? Does this contradict things or support things that we know from Tolkien's Legendarium? Now, I know we aren't sticking very closely to the timeline itself, but I'm still going to think about and kind of weigh how it measures up in this section. I gave this section the most weight of all since, at the end of the day, this is supposed to be a story based in Middle-earth, so it should feel like one. Plot. Does this story make sense on its own? In this section, we aren't comparing it to Tolkien's plots because we did that in the previous section, but we're really just trying to look at the story as it stands on its own and ask, does this work? Dialogue. Does this dialogue fit for Middle-earth? Is it too silly? Is it too serious? Is it too clunky? Is there anything that's said that pulls me out of the story? Do these lines land? Do these lines make any sense? Um, does this dialogue make me go, oh my gosh, no way? You know, like, um, are there any moments that stick in my head? Characterization. Do these characters make sense? Are their motivations clear? Do I understand why they're acting the way they are? Now, even though we covered Tolkienian core, I do want to ask myself here, do these characters feel like their Tolkien counterparts? Does the Galadriel of Rings of Power feel like the Galadriel of Unfinished Tales? Pacing. Do these episodes convey the passage of time well? Does the story feel natural? Am I able to ground myself in the timeline of the story? Does it feel too rushed, too slow? What's the pace like? Visuals. This one is easy. Does it look like Middle Earth? Am I impressed by what I'm seeing? Are there any aspects that fall flat or things that kind of pull me out of the enjoyment of the story? Are there any highlights? Music and audio. Does the sound match the overall look of the story? Does the score complement the story or add depth to it? Do I feel like the music is able to like convey the emotions that I'm supposed to be feeling right now? Editing. Are we jumping between plot lines too quickly? Do the cuts between scenes feel natural or are they jarring? Are there any visual effects that feel clunky or pull you out of the immersion? Or is everything incredible and amazing? The last one is enjoyability. Obviously, this is the most subjective of all of my categories, but at the end of the day, this is a TV show, and I want to have fun. Am I having fun? Does this series strike a chord with me emotionally? Am I bored and skipping scenes, or am I crying my eyes out? So these are kind of all the questions that I'm asking myself while I'm doing my rewatch and really wanting to think through season one before we sort of... I'm not going to say let go of it because we'll always have it, but season one is definitely going to be recontextualized once we see season two. So I wanted to kind of put all of my thoughts together before then. Then at the end of the video, I will add up each episode's score to come up with a score for the season as a whole, kind of like a little grade report. What's it called? Report card. Kind of like a little report card. 
um, we're going to give the season a grade for each category as well, which is going to be fun. Episode one, a shadow of the past. Episode synopsis provided by Amazon. Series premiere. Galadriel is disturbed by signs of an ancient evil's return. Arondir makes an unsettling discovery. Elrond is presented with an intriguing new venture. Nori breaks the Harfoot community's most deeply held rule. I thought these episode synopsis, synopses were kind of funny. Um, I just pulled them off of the Amazon website, but it would be kind of, I thought it would be a little helpful to have a, a short summary of what happens in each episode. For this episode, in the Tolkienian core and themes section, I gave it a 10 out of 20. The prologue was excellent with many nods to the Silmarillion, but it was difficult to find my footing as a viewer once we moved into the present day story. Gil-galad handing out a trip to the Valinor retirement home as a reward for Galadriel's military achievement made little sense to me, especially when you think about the way that it was kind of a thinly veiled attempt to just like remove her from the situation. Like, what should we do with Galadriel? She's causing problems. Let's send her to Valinor. Um, she's being treated as a petulant child. And that felt weird to me, even though she's also acting like one, which also felt weird. A strange giant man arriving via meteor where the fire is not hot, but it's actually cold, didn't feel particularly Tolkienian to me. Maybe there's something about it hidden in like volume eight of the history of Middle Earth that I haven't read yet. But as far as I know, that sort of thing doesn't really happen very often. And it kind of felt a little more generic fantasy than Lord of the Rings to me. However, the introduction of Celebrimbor was really exciting. So overall, I mean, it wasn't too bad, but there were just some things where I was like, hmm, this is a bit odd. For plot, I gave this episode a five. I wish this episode would have better explained why Galadriel was pursuing Sauron so far north. When she and, what's that guy's name, Gigwit say, you know, we should have been here by now. And then she's like, we are there and they discover the icy fortress. It's like I had no idea that they were looking for such a specific location, so it felt a little bit silly. I'm totally on board with the idea that Galadriel would have rejected a return home to Valinor at this time, but I think having her jump from the boat felt a little contrived to me. It felt as if they were like, well, we need to set up the conditions for her to meet Sauron in the middle of the ocean so they can go to Numenor, so why don't we have her jump from a boat. I know Galadriel is meant to be operating in a bad state of mind, but to me this just felt like a little bit too much. The elven outposts being disbanded so rapidly didn't make a ton of sense because elves are supposed to be slow to change, so it felt like they were like breaking everything, you know, packing up, breaking everything down in like 30 minutes and just disappearing overnight. I also didn't really understand or enjoy the meteor plot line. Um, the way that everyone sees it at the end of the episode, maybe this will be explained more in season two. I understand, like, the, I, I think the idea behind it was that some kind of sign is being sent from the heavens to warn people about the return of Sauron, but it would seem Sauron's been around for a while. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm willing to wait and see if something in season two makes this make a little more sense for me. For dialogue, I gave this episode an 8. My favorite line was, nothing is evil in the beginning. But a close second was when Gil Gallad said, the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread, which was oddly fitting for Galadriel, and we will see the consequences of that wind uh, moving forward. The dialogue for the Harfoots was also very distinct to their storyline, which I found really cute. And the same goes for the Southlanders. I feel like I was immediately immersed in their culture based on the dialogue and the way they spoke. Rowan's dialogue, Theo's friend who calls Arondir knife ears, I just thought he his character really stood out to me as kind of the embodiment of the Southlands and the way that everyone has kind of grown up in this muck and filth and they kind of hate the elves. Gil Gallad's dialogue felt pretty flat, but maybe this was an intentional for characterization, I gave this episode a six. I felt it was a little bit odd for the young Galadriel to be such an unruly misfit and getting into fist fights in Valinor because then 20 minutes later, she's talking to Elrond about Valinor and she's like, when I was a child, 
This warmth and peace was the only thing I knew. Meanwhile, we just saw her like having a really hard time in Valinor and getting into fights with the other children. So I felt like that was, you know, she's kind of an unreliable narrator, which sure, like she is in in the Silmarillion. So I get it. I do wonder if there was potentially a better way to convey the darkness within her. When she's talking to Finrod, though, and she says, it's hard to say which way is up and which is down. How am I to know which lights to follow? I did think that was a good moment for young Galadriel. Elrond's characterization in the first episode was so sweet, and I loved the way that he was introduced, especially considering all of the suffering he's about to be going through. The introduction to the Harfoots was well done. I think they were really well characterized. Together with the Southlanders, I think they're kind of supposed to represent the ordinary everyday people who will later suffer at the hands of Sauron. So it was nice to get acquainted with them before things get rolling. I wish the elves of Linden would have gotten such a good introduction as the Harfoots and Southlanders did because Linden felt super flat and empty, honestly. Finrod's character was also interesting and not how I ever imagined him, but I don't think I'm necessarily mad about that. I hope that we'll get to see more glimpses of him further down the seasons. I'm not sure if it feels in character for Finrod to recommend Galadriel to touch the darkness. This is something I go back and forth on even still, but I do like that it kind of leaves you to ponder it. I also loved Arondir and Bronwyn's interactions, and I thought they were really sweet, which I thought was interesting because in the lead up to season one, when we were hearing all these rumors about a forbidden romance between an elf and a human, I was so annoyed by it because of the way that doesn't really happen very often in Tolkien, but the way they wrote it, I thought was really sweet. So I, was, I wasn't mad after all. For pacing, I gave this episode an eight. While I'd have loved a two hour long prologue, I understand why it had to be structured the way that it was. And I think they did a great job of explaining so much history to a general audience while also providing some lore nods to the big Tolkien nerds like myself. I didn't give this a full 10 because I didn't feel like it was completely perfect, but it was pretty good, but it's kind of hard to put my finger on why. Sorry. For visuals, I gave this episode a 10. My favorite shot was Finrod walking up the hill in Valinor towards the two trees. When I was at the screening for this episode, I immediately started crying. I just had like tears rolling down my face because I never thought in my life I would ever see Valinor on TV, let alone, you know, in a giant movie theater with the most amazing score playing in the background. So that was really touching. I also felt like the entire prologue was stunning. The whole thing was a work of art. And the rolling back of the rain curtains as the boat is approaching Valinor was also really touching. And that was a highlight for me. For music, I gave this episode a 10. My favorite track from this album was Prologue, which was very similar to In the Beginning from the main score album. Bear McCreary just honestly cooked. He did such a good job with this score. I don't have any complaints or criticisms. Spoiler alert for this video, but I gave music a 10 for every episode because it's better than I ever thought it could be. Um, It's so moving and it tells a story in a way that sometimes even the words can't. He just did amazing and we are so lucky to have him on this show. For editing, I gave this episode a 9. All of the visual effects were stunning and really brilliant. The transitions using the map were really helpful in establishing distances between locations and grounded the viewer in a new setting, which I think it was really great. It it was awesome. Enjoyability, I gave this episode a 7. I feel like I was still finding my footing as a viewer coming into this series, not really understanding what the purpose of the story was quite yet. While it was really beautiful and a privilege to return to Middle-earth, especially to see Valinor on screen for the first time, I finished the episode feeling intrigued but also still confused. On doing my rewatch, I absolutely hate the ads that Prime Video includes before and during the episodes. They severely disrupt the whole experience and they are often cut into the most awful moments. I have also noticed that a lot of the times they have like a, there's a difference between the volume that you're watching the show on versus the ads. So you might be watching like in bed at night with the volume kind of low and then suddenly an ad will come on and it's like the volume is twice as loud. So that like severely ruins the enjoyability of this series. And I really hope that at least when the season two premiere comes out, they'll kind of maybe hold back on the ads for a month or so so people can actually enjoy it because 
man, like when you're thinking about Valinor and then there's an ad for like Clorox, it just, it ruins the whole thing. For episode one, the total score was 73 out of 100. Moving on to episode two, Adrift. We need to pick up the pace a little bit because this video is already pretty long. Episode synopsis, Galadriel finds a new ally. Elrond faces a cold reception from an old friend. Nori endeavors to help a stranger. Arondir searches for answers while Bronwyn warns her people of a threat. The biggest episode highlight for me in this episode was seeing a Region for the first time and Feanor's hammer. Like, I could not believe my eyes. Seeing his hammer, that's so cool. The low point for me of this episode was Meteor Man, unfortunately. I love the performance of Daniel Wayman. I don't think anybody did anything wrong. Like, the acting is good, the costuming is good, the setting is good. It's just I don't like the story. So I feel a little bit bad criticizing it, but just personally, I don't like it. For Tolkienian Corin themes, I gave this episode a 13. The high point was meeting the dwarves for the first time. They were so perfectly done, and I really feel they captured Tolkien's vision for the dwarves. Eregion and Celebrimbor were also a major highlight. The low point in terms of Tolkienian core, Meteor Man still doesn't feel like Tolkien. Sauron and Galadriel's little meet cute on the raft made it feel clear that we are in uncharted territory with this series. It's a story of its own. The idea that Sauron and Galadriel met in the middle of an ocean under these circumstances is just, it's, it's their own story. I love it personally, but like, I don't know how Tolkien would feel about it. For plot, I gave this episode a six. Galadriel randomly swimming and running into Sauron of all people in the middle of the ocean felt silly. Um, then there's a sea monster who attacks their raft but spares Sauron and Galadriel conveniently leaving them alone together in the ocean. I do hope this is explored in season two, but I know they had to figure out a way to make it work somehow, but I s still, it feels a bit much. Celebrimbor saying that he needs his forge completed by spring. Why? There's no reason that an elf would need something completed by spring. And I have no idea what season the show is currently in right now. Are they, uh, you know, is spring two weeks away or is it, the first week of summer and they have almost a whole year. We're not really grounded in the story in terms of the timeline and setting, I felt. So I really didn't know how urgent that was supposed to be. I felt the stranger killing the fireflies was really weird and I can't think of any explanation for it other than they were just trying to make you wonder if he was Sauron. I think the idea of the stranger having all of this power but not knowing how to control it is interesting, but... If he's Gandalf, what's the point? If he's not Gandalf, what's the point? For dialogue, I gave this episode an 8. My favorite line was, true creation requires a sacrifice. That's going to be something that kind of continues on, especially in season 2, unfortunately. Celebrimbor's story about the beauty of the Silmarils nearly turning Morgoth's heart was also a highlight. Celebrimbor's line about caring for an aging parent didn't make any sense because Elves don't really age in the same way. And when you think about Celebrimbor's relationship with his own dad, there wasn't a lot of caring involved. So I thought that line was, I don't know, it just didn't make a ton of sense. At the end of the day, it's not a huge deal. The dialogue between Halbrand and Galadriel is super interesting because you can sense the gears turning in his mind as he's working out a plan as soon as he knows who she is. And he also isn't lying outright. Galadriel is like, are you going to tell me where the enemy is or not? And he says, the Southlands. And it's true because Adar is his enemy. But then when she's trying to like force him along with her ideas, he's like, I've got my own plans, elf. And it's true. He does have his own plans, even though we don't know what they are. The dialogue at the end of the episode between Durin III and his son was also really, really great. When he says there can be no trust between hammer and rock. That felt like such a dwarven thing to say. And it was great. For characterization, I gave this episode a nine. Meeting Sauron for the first time and doing this rewatch knowing that he is Sauron made his scenes a lot more enjoyable. I don't really like Nori having this complex that she's like really special and has this special destiny. She claims that it's the stranger who's special, but I feel like the way they go about it feels kind of like the opposite of Bilbo or Frodo maybe, where Bilbo and Frodo are like, 
oh no, this great destiny has been forced upon me and I have to kind of do it even though I don't want to, even though I'm scared. Nori is like, I got to get out of this little small town and this is my ticket out kind of. is That's how it feels to me. Elrond was once again a highlight. I loved the small touches to his character, like how he was too tall for the ceilings in Casa Doom or how diplomatic he was with the dwarves. Once again, the dwarves are just perfect. I have no notes on them. For pacing, I gave this episode an eight. Southland's plotline stood out to me really well. I feel like we spent a good amount of time there. Theo being so troubled and angsty was really fun. And him seeing the orc eye pop out under the floorboards was a great moment. Like, I totally jumped. So it was fun. Like, I really enjoy so far how the series is a little scary, but it's not horrifying. The orc fight scene was really great, too. For visuals, I gave this episode a nine. My favorite shot, now this isn't necessarily a shot, but the whole scene in which Sauron saves Galadriel from drowning, I found it really moving and beautiful and sort of this visual representation of Sauron in his repentant era, which is a soft spot for me. I also remember being at the premiere and when I saw this happen, I was just absolutely convinced that Halbrand couldn't be Sauron because why in the world would he save his chief adversary from dying? It would be so much easier for him if she would have just drowned right there. So I kind of have like a little sentimental spot for this moment because I was very, very wrong. My favorite track from this album is Sundering Seas. And of course, I gave the music a 10 again. Editing gave it a nine. I don't have any complaints. I'm sure it probably could have been slightly better in ways, but um, I'm trying not to give too many things tens just because I don't know. A nine seems reasonable. Enjoyability. I also gave this episode a seven. Nori and the stranger eating the snails was so gross. And the ankle breaking scene for Nori's dad was so oddly disturbing. And it felt really out of place where like it was just so in, I don't know, it just disgusted me. I also kind of feel the same way about episode two as I did with episode one. It's taking a while to get moving and for me to find my footing within the story to really understand where where we're going and what the purpose of the story is. Overall, I gave this episode a 79, which is a little bit better than episode one, but still not, we're not like, this is my favorite show territory quite yet. Episode three, Adar. Synopsis. Arondir finds himself a captive. Galadriel and Halbrand explore a legendary kingdom. Elendil is given a new assignment. Nori faces the consequences. This is kind of funny because it sounds like Nori is facing the consequences of Elendil's new assignment. Episode highlights. The major highlight of this episode was seeing Numenor for the first time. This is another one of those settings, kind of like Valinor, where I never thought I would see it on screen. And it is just perfection. Episode low points, I didn't really have a lot. I think episode three is one of my favorites. I think it's my second favorite episode. For Tolkienian court and themes, I gave this an 18. The beauty and splendor of Numenor was so wonderfully conveyed, especially with the statue of Arendil visible. It was awe-inspiring. The elf and orc conflict was also really well done, and I think it captured the Tolkienian themes of both races. Arondir asking the tree for forgiveness before having to chop it down was like an absolute highlight of the whole show. And knowing that Ismael Cruz Cordova came up with that idea himself is a huge testament to his devotion to the character. And I loved that it made it into the final cut. I also loved that they had an Elros reference as well when they went to the Hall of Lore. And the statue of Uinan in the prison was also a super good nod to Tolkien. And I felt like it was a really good way to allude to Sauron's journey in comparison to the other Maiar. Like, Imagine being Sauron, one of the Maya, and you're sitting in this little dingy old jail cell and right outside your door is a statue made out of marble or something for someone who's just like you. Like all of the Maya have this potential to either be so great or so evil. And Sauron has kind of chosen his path at this point. And to have to sit in front of the statue of Uinan for hours upon hours, like that must have stung for him. And I love that they included it. For the plot, I gave this episode a seven. Arondir waking up in the orc tents was an amazing opener. And then when we get to the horror of the realization that he sees the other elves have been captured too, that whole scene was great. The initial Numenor scenes felt a little awkward. Once again, it kind of felt like everyone was still finding their footing. I, I kind of wonder if these were shot in early days of filming. I'm not sure. 
The mysterious Sauron sigil ending up just being a map was kind of disappointing after all of the hype and build up, but it is what it is. I don't really like the stranger's incident at the Harfoot Festival or the confrontation of Nori. To potentially condemn her family to death because of what she did was insane. But then at the same time, they're like, ah, rules, rule, what rules? Like, you know, like it, it's such an extreme moment. It's one second, they're like, you're D caravan. We're going to leave you to die. And then the next second, they're like, nah, we should be nice to her. She can k- k- keep coming, you know, like we should be nice to her. They're fine. Uh, just give them a little slap on the wrist instead. Like living in that kind of culture would be really stressful. I also felt the idea that the Harfoots would condemn their own kin to death in the wilderness when they have a few dozen perfectly good carts, probably at least 60 able-bodied people who could help pull the Brandyfoot cart while Largo rides in it. Why would you not do that? Like, what an awful place to live. I wouldn't want to live with these people either. I would rather be decaravaned. My last note on the plot, the death of Revion the elf was really moving and it showed the brotherhood between the elves really, really well. I loved that moment. Dialogue, I gave this episode a six. I loved the orc dialogue. I think they did such a great job. I did not really like a lot of the Numenor dialogue. Galadriel threatening Elendil, like, why? Like, she's being so hasty. Um, The sea is always right was kind of a low point for me, but I also think it works in a way because it's quite cheesy, and I can see how it would work in the context of Numenor, forsaking their old ways and turning to worship of the sea instead of reverence for the Valar. So it's like, yeah, this isn't the smartest sentiment, but the Numenorians aren't the smartest people, so it kind of makes sense. Um, and then the tavern scene with Halbrand when when he's like, don't forget you're a woman. And then they say, perhaps Galadriel would prefer someone of better breeding. I thought this was bizarre. It indicated this possessiveness that Sauron felt for Galadriel that didn't really make sense in light of the constant insistence that he has no romantic feelings towards her. I feel like they were trying to convey that the Numenorians feel superior to the men of Middle-earth and That's why they use the like breeding line. But to be like, perhaps you'd prefer someone of better breeding. And then Halbrand gets jealous and like beats these guys up in the alley. But no, no, like he doesn't have feelings for her. Like it just landed in a weird way for me. For characterization, I give this episode a seven. The orcs were wonderful. I loved their devotion to Adar. And that's not something we've seen in Tolkien before, but it's really cool. And it makes sense that they would have this loyalty to someone who's taking care of them. I also really enjoyed Isildur's characterization of someone who loves Numenor but doesn't really know how to express it or live up to his ideals. Elendil is at a point at the beginning of the story where he's conflicted about whether or not he wants to be counted among the faithful and bear the risk that comes with that. And that was really enjoyable because I think we're going to see as the story moves on, he's going to have to choose. Galadriel in Numenor is where I think her characterization is really the weakest because she just feels so insufferable. It's hard to deal with it. Like there are people being nice to her or helping her out one after another. And she's just like, I should kill you instead. Or I'm going to break out and and sneak around and do all this stuff. Like, And she's manipulating everyone. I feel like I kind of get what they're doing with her, but it was still a little bit hard to watch. Halbrand trying to get a job as a smith's aide and then getting into a fist fight in the alley like immediately after was really funny um, when you think about the fact that he is Sauron, but it was also great foreshadowing. I loved the way that they showed him being so drawn to the forge because we know that Sauron was a great smith. The jail cell conversation between Halbrand and Galadriel was also one of my favorites because I feel like even behind his disguise, there's a lot of honesty in this dialogue. For pacing, I give this episode a 10. It's nice to spend a lot of time in one location. We're in Numenor a lot this episode, and there wasn't too much jumping around, and I also feel like the passage of time made a little more sense. For visuals, I give this episode an 8. My favorite shot is the moment where Galadriel confronts Halbrand about his identity. She's discovered he's a king, and it's actually hilarious looking back now because she's like, you're more than you seem, and he's probably wondering, oh no, she knows I'm Sauron. And then she's like, Actually, I think you're this lost king really special. 
um i don't know the whole scene was great it was it was funny but it was also i think really good storytelling um we did lose two points for the animation of the warg being clunky it it almost looked like stop motion animation the warg was not how i expected it to look i've grown to love it in the years since but i was just kind of surprised by that moment um and the first look of numenor was incredible just like a 10 out of 10 for visuals I also felt that Medor, the other elf friend of Arondir, his death scene was weird because the cut on his neck was so superficial. It looks like he died of a paper cut. There was like, you know, five drops of blood and then he died. And then at the same time in the same scene, the warg is like eating people's bellies and there's like intestines everywhere. So I thought it was just the disconnect or like the difference between one death scene and another in the same scene was weird to me. For music, of course, I gave this a, a 10 again. Um, my favorite track was Numenor. So the Numenor theme was really, really cool to hear for the first time. It was incredible. Editing, I gave this episode an 8. We spent like 20 full minutes in Numenor, and then we used the map transition to move us back to Arondir in the Southlands, and I loved that. I didn't like the transition from Numenor to the Harfoots wearing the masks for their festival because they initially looked like orcs. And it seemed like that has a sinister implication for the Harfoots when everyone insists that they're these wholesome little guys, but then for a second you think they're orcs. Um, I also didn't like all the slow motion in this episode, sorry. For enjoyability, though, I did give this episode a 10. Bring him to Adar it was an iconic way to end the episode, even though it was torture to wait an entire week until episode four to actually see Adar because he was my most anticipated character. With a combination of the Orc Camp and Numenor, I think this was a really strong episode. It was one of my favorites. And also, the tension between Sauron and Galadriel is so insane in this episode. It's hard to believe on rewatch. Like, if that's not flirting, I don't know what it is, but the way that they're acting is insane. Total score for this episode was 84. Episode 4, The Great Wave. Episode Synopsis. Queen Regent Muriel's faith is tested. Isildur finds himself at a crossroads. Elrond uncovers a secret. Arondir is given an ultimatum. Theo disobeys Bronwyn. I love how vague these are. Just jumping right into Tolkienian Corin themes. I loved the mention of Arendil. Anytime we get to hear about him, I'm happy. I think that the Numenorean themes could have been explained better, but they were still explained fairly well. We got the foreshadowing of Numenor's fall with the shot of the great wave. The white leaves falling is an interesting moment. And I loved the way that it's kind of conveyed between Elendil and Muriel, where they see the white, the white petals and they're like, oh, shoot. The usage of the palantir felt a little bit odd to me. It seems like as, it seems to be as if it's stuck playing a specific recording on a loop which I haven't necessarily understood to be the way Palantiri work. I think this episode was a good opportunity to wrestle through the question of which moments are divine intervention and which are Sauron at work. So is it Sauron causing the petals to fall? Is it truly one of the Valar? Is it Eru? Um, I don't think these questions will ever really be answered, but they add a lot of depth to the story, and I think they, they earned some good points for Tolkienian core and themes. For a plot, I gave this episode a 7. I didn't like Galadriel breaking into the tower. Like, it shows us a shot of a really tall tower, and then you go cut straight to her breaking in. It kind of implies she scaled this, like, 200-foot tall tower, which, I mean, she's wearing, like, a floor-length gown. To me, I don't understand that. I also felt like her fake-out of leaving Numenor was dumb. I don't know. I just didn't, I don't know. I didn't like it. Celebrimbor manipulating Elrond was a weird scene and it was kind of uncanny, but I think it was good foreshadowing. So I liked it, even though it was kind of uncomfortable. The miners in Khazadum all surviving the rock fall. I feel like this is mean, but I feel like at least one of those miners should have died because there is a lot of risk happening here. And so for them to kind of defy the king and cause this big problem and then to be like, oh, we all got out, you know, everyone's fine. Um, I felt it kind of lowered the stakes. We should have had a little more risk, maybe. 
The episode ending with Isildur saying that he will serve alongside Muriel to go to Middle-earth was great, but it didn't really make a ton of sense the way that so many people in Numenor were suddenly willing to go to Middle-earth on behalf of Muriel, on behalf of an elf, because earlier on in Numenor, we kind of get people disrespecting Muriel, and obviously they don't like elves. So was everyone in Numenor just excited to go on like a little vacation to Middle-earth? I didn't really understand that fully. It would have been helpful, I think, to have just like a tiny bit more context for that. Like, why are they excited to serve? For dialogue, I gave this episode an eight. My favorite line was Adar's dialogue with Arondir when he's like, I walked down by the river once when I was young. And then he says, the banks were covered in sage blossoms. I don't know why the way that it's delivered maybe was so good. And it was chilling. It shows you how old Adar is. Um, that he still remembers his youth when he was an elf. And then when Arondir is just like, why do the orcs call you father? We do lose a point for the elves taking our jobs speech. You know, that could have just been done a little bit better. I think the idea behind it was that Tamar, who is the Numenorean guy kind of egging these people on, I think he's meant to represent like the blue collar Numenorean worker. And so his concern would be for his job, especially after the Southlander Halbrand did try to literally steal his guild crest, which is how he has his job. So I can see the mindset. Tamar is not supposed to be the most intelligent guy. Um, and then I think they also used kind of a low level of rhetoric here so that when Farazon comes in and sort of saves the day, it makes him look smarter. So I get it, but again, again, I feel like I've had to deal with so much irritating discourse online over this line. I did really like Farazone's character in this episode, though, when he says, cleverness is from men of small ambition. Farazone is definitely going to become a really great character as we move forward. Characterization, I give this episode an 8. I really think that the way they did Sauron advising Galadriel was very clever. Although Galadriel and Numenor is still kind of grating to me, especially in her argument with Muriel. I just feel like she was being so disrespectful and uncooperative. I did not like Kemen flirting with A. Aryan. I found it really creepy when she's like, I don't make a habit of going out with strange young men. And he's like, I'll tell you if I see any. Like clearly she meant that she thought you were a strange man and him not taking no for an answer to me was like red flag. I thought it was creepy. And then I logged on to Twitter and see everyone talking about how smooth Kemen is. So I don't, I just, maybe I just don't get it. I don't see the vision. Rowan was the most compelling Southlands character because of how much of a cautionary tale he is. I think he is meant to be like this every man, even though he's still a child. He feels hopeless amidst these dire circumstances and he ends up making several bad choices because of it. The conversation between Disa and Durin and Elrond, where Elrond mentions wishing he could speak to his father, was also really beautiful and moving. And that was one of the highlights of the episode. For pacing, I gave this episode a nine. It didn't feel too rushed, but it, maybe it could have been a little bit better. Visuals, I really loved the orcs. I thought they were so cool. Their costuming was great. The way they moved was great. Overall, just everyone who worked on the orc plotline, I think they did amazing. And then the visual of the Great Wave was awesome. It was good foreshadowing as well. For music, my favorite track was A Plea to the Rock. This kind of ties in with editing as well. I gave music and editing both a 10. The highlight of the editing for me was this transition between Arondir, Bronwyn, and Theo escaping from the forest into the clearing. The sun is rising and we have this, we have the music playing and then Disa is resonating. And at first you can't tell that it's Disa resonating. You just think it's, you know, some beautiful music. And then it cuts to Disa and that whole scene, the way that they transitioned was really well done. For enjoyability, I gave this episode a nine. There were plenty of serious moments as well as funny ones that kept the episode really enjoyable. I took a point off because I just, I feel so awful. I'm sorry. I'm not a Galadriel hater. I actually love Galadriel. But her characterization in Numenor bugged me. And I'm also annoyed by Kemen. Sorry. The elves taking our job bit makes sense to me. But, you know, it still caused problems. When you're trying to moderate a Tolkien community online and you have to deal with this line coming up in conversation, it just gives me a headache. The balance between serious and humor is really well done when the Dwarven storyline gets a good amount of screen time. So this episode really shines 
Elrond recounting to Disa how he and Durin the Fourth met was so funny to me when Elrond says, the screams were so high pitched, I thought it was a child. Uh, that moment just cracks me up. So total score for episode four was an 87. Episode five, Partings. Synopsis. Nori questions her instincts. Elrond struggles to stay true to his oath. Halbrand weighs his destiny. The Southlanders brace for attack. This episode, I'm not super excited to discuss because it was my least favorite. So I'm sorry. I know a lot of people loved this episode. The low point of the whole series for me is the mithril origin myth. For Tolkienian core and themes, this episode gets a 5 out of 20. They lost so many points for the mithril story. And I'm so sorry, JD and Patrick, because I know you meant well with this story, but I just, I hate it and I'm sorry. For plot, I gave this episode a six. It's unclear why the Harfoots need to migrate. It's not really explained how often do they migrate, where are they going, why are they traveling so far. Not a lot of information is given there. It made me feel kind of less committed to the plot because I didn't understand what the stakes were. By episode five, I'm also really struggling not to skip past the Harfoot scenes, just to be brutally honest. And I feel terrible because their dialogue is good, the visuals are great. The acting is wonderful, but I just don't enjoy their story. I don't find it relevant. If we're here to have a story about the Second Age, we should be spending more time with Numenor and the elves, not the Harfoots. I'm sorry. The orcs saying that the tunnels have been completed and then Adar talking about how he will miss the sun was really exciting because for my first time watching, I was like, what is he going to do to the sun? Uh, it was a very ambitious goal of him. So it was kind of a cool tease for what's to come. For dialogue, I gave this episode a seven. I love the dialogue for the most part, but there's this joke about the elves taking two weeks to decide whether to go to the bathroom. And uh, I hated that line. It felt very un-Tolkien. I don't think there are like any bathroom jokes in The Lord of the Rings. Definitely not in The Silmarillion, but it just bugged me. I also didn't really like Galadriel giving the Numenorians their lessons on how to kill an orc where she goes, there are many ways to kill an orc, but I will keep it simple. And then she's like, stab, twist, gut. Like, it felt a little too quippy. I did love when Adar said, summon the legions, it is time. Like, anything Adar says is cool. I didn't really like when the stranger is learning how to speak and he's trying to say migration and he says, my great thumb. I just thought, I, I don't know, it's kind of cute, but I didn't enjoy it. Durin the fourth swindling the elves out of the table was funny, but again, the bathroom joke irritated me. But the best dialogue, I think, was when Sauron is mad with Galadriel and he says, find another head to crown, because this line is going to hit really hard after we see the first episode of season two. And I can't wait to kind of go back and watch season one after we've seen season two, because it's definitely going to recontextualize things. For characterization, I give this episode an eight. Elrond, Celebrimbor, and the dwarves were the highlight. I loved how Theo is really wrestling with which path to choose moving forward. He seems like he wants to go with Waldrig, but he also doesn't want to lose his mom. So in the future, if his mom's out of the picture, I wonder what he might choose. Farazon's dialogue with Kemen was also a highlight for me. His subtle characterization is really good. We also see Celebrimbor continuing to manipulate Elrond. I feel like his ambition is driving him. And Elrond always wants to make his family proud. He's an orphan. Celebrimbor keeps talking about his parents. Like, it's a little messed up the way he's doing it. But I kind of admire, not admire, but, you know, you recognize what Celebrimbor is up to. Pacing, I gave this episode a seven. There were too many plot lines in this episode. It was also difficult to tell the passage of time. Visuals. For visuals, ironically, I think the best, coolest shot was the mithril shot. Even though it irritated me, it was also really beautiful. It's uh, something that's like, I, this is beautiful, but I don't like it. For music, I gave, of course, a 10. My favorite track from this episode was This Wandering Day, which, which is Poppy's walking song. It's such a sweet song, and I loved it. For editing, I gave it an 8. For enjoyability, ooh, I gave this episode a 4. I'm so sorry. I ended up fast-forwarding past a lot of scenes in this episode that I just didn't enjoy at all. This was the lowest episode of the season for me personally, the mithril thing agitated me a lot. 
I know it was a risk that they felt they needed to take in order to explain Mithril and sort of connect it to the rest of the story. And I'm happy if it landed for other fans, but it's just a no from me. I'll also say by episode five, I got so annoyed by the ads that Prime puts in every episode now that I subscribe to the ad-free Prime video, which is like $3 a month. And then the fact that I did that made me even more irritated. So I just was very grumpy watching this episode. Overall, this episode got a score of 70, which is funny because I said it like I don't like this episode at all, but that's not really a bad grade. Episode six, however, was probably my favorite. Episode synopsis. The episode synopsis is kind of hilariously short. It's just Adar and his army march on Ostirith. The highlight of this episode for me was the Galadriel and Adar dialogue. Episode low points, there weren't any. This episode was almost perfect. For Tolkienian court and themes, I gave this episode a 17. The dialogue between Adar and Galadriel begins to explore the origins of orcs and this moral question that Tolkien himself wrestled with. And that earned the series major Tolkien core points for me. Like, for however many they lost for the Mithril, I feel like they earned those right back for this dialogue about the orcs. We also learned a lot about Adar, a little bit about his backstory, and about what Sauron's plans were after the fall of Morgoth which is going to come in handy as we continue with the story. I did think it was odd to have Adar and the orcs create Mount Doom through this sort of like complex practical scheme that kind of reminded me of like a marble run or where you're knocking dominoes over. For plot, I gave this episode an eight. I love that we're getting into the beef between Sauron and Adar, which I know will be explained in season two. The moment in which we realized that Theo wasn't holding the hilt shard after all and that they had been deceived was genuinely so surprising to me And then Waldreg being the one to use it was so incredible. When the orcs started chanting Udun too, as like the ground started shaking, once the sword hilt mechanism thing had been enacted, that was really cool. It was very like the suspense is building and then things start to go crazy. I don't really understand the mechanics of this sword key dam thing with the tunnels. It was certainly fun, but did it make sense? I also imagine... Honestly, if in a, if a volcano had erupted in this capacity, I feel like Galadriel's hair would have at the very least been burnt off by the explosion. I know she she's special. She's an elf. So, okay, she can survive. But like, I don't know. But at the end of the day, this is a fantasy show, so I can't be mad. For dialogue, I gave this episode a 10. My favorite line, of course, comes from Halbrand and Galadriel when they're sitting on the log in the forest when he says, Fighting at your side, I felt if I could just hold on to that feeling, keep it with me always, bind it to my very being. And then Galadriel's like, I felt it too. I actually didn't like the part where she said I felt it too, because what does she mean? She felt she felt what to? Like, this isn't supposed to be romantic, so what is she feeling? But the way that Sauron said, bind it to my very being, like, I should have known. Of course he's Sauron. Like, It was like almost like they were waving a flag right in my face saying this dude is Sauron, but I just I still wouldn't believe it. I also loved the line when this is back to the beginning of the episode when Adar is planting a seed before the battle and he says new life in defiance of death. That was really beautiful and really Tolkienian. And then when he's giving his initial speech to the orcs, he says, my children, we have endured much. Yet tonight, one more trial awaits us. But for the first time, you do so not as unnamed slaves in faraway lands, but as brothers and sisters in our home. The way that they're writing this story, where we have Adar, who's the father of the orcs, his his only goal is to create a home for them. Like, what a cool character. For characterization, I give this episode a 10. Isildur and Elendil in battle was a great moment and their conversation afterwards as father and son was also really touching. I loved how they like hugged. I thought that was so cute and it was kind of a reminder of how young Isildur still is. Galadriel's genocidal tendencies when dealing with Adar felt a little bit extreme to me Um, and I think Adar had a good point when he told her to look into her own mirror to find Morgoth's successor because at this point she's so far like far away from who she's supposed to be and I know that's the point Sauron's confession to Gladriel also felt like a really honest moment once again despite his mask the way that Sauron smiles when he's declared the lord of the southlands was also really funny 
going back and realizing who he is. And yeah, Southlands are Mordor. He's the he's going to be the Lord of Mordor. It makes sense. I also, once again, I'm loving Theo's character as he's continuing to grow. When he confesses to Arondir that he liked how powerful the sword made him feel, that felt like a really important moment that we should all be paying attention to. I expect big things are in his future. I also loved Arondir stepping up to offer Theo his counsel. Like, their relationship is really sweet. Pacing, I gave it a 10. This episode was really intense and filled with a lot of action and exciting moments, but I think because of that, the more intimate or slow moments were savored even more, and the way they balanced it was really well done. For visuals, the eruption of Mount Doom is probably the objectively coolest moment of the episode, but I'm also partial to the shot of Halbrand and Galadriel on the little log in the forest. Kind of looks like it could be a Renaissance painting, but, you know, I'm just a little bit biased. My favorite track from this episode because of course the music is once again a 10, was transformed by darkness, but it's actually almost impossible for me to choose because Nampot was also such a banger. For editing, I gave this episode a 10 as well because it stayed within one plot line and that was such a treat. It felt like a treat because of how often the other episodes were jumping around. For enjoyability, I give this episode a 10. This was my highest rated episode and that makes sense because I've always felt it was my favorite Watching it with my kids was really fun. Obviously, we probably we had to skip some of the very scary parts, but it was really exciting to see, to watch them watching the volcano erupting for the first time because my kids were like slowly realizing it. And of course, kids kind of narrate their thoughts out loud. So they're saying like, oh, no what's that what you know they're they're talking through it and like I always watch the episodes before I watched with my kids so I would know if I had to skip anything and the hype and like the suspense of me watching them watching it happen was so cool I I feel like it was like a sweet memory for me as a mom to see them seeing it happen I don't know Um, I also appreciated how they took care to show after the little forest chase scene on the horses when Sauron trips Adar's horse and then Adar flies off. I really appreciate how they took care to show the horse getting back up after because I'm always worried about these fictional animals. Like obviously I would, I mean, I would assume that no horses were actually harmed as they were making it, but I always worry about like, I don't want a fictional horse to die either. My total score for episode six was a 95, making it my favorite episode. Episode seven, the eye. Episode synopsis. Survivors of a cataclysm try to find safety. The Harfoots confront evil. Durin is torn between friendship and duty. Adar considers a new name. The episode highlights for me were the scenes in Khazad Doom. We didn't know this when we saw the season for the first time, but this is our last chance to see the dwarves this season, and I think they really nailed the scenes and did a great job. Episode low points. The lowest point of this episode for me was the Harfoot speech about how sweet and wholesome they are when Largo stares directly into the camera and says, our hearts are as big as our feet. I just didn't like it. For Tolkienian core and themes, I gave this episode an 8 out of 20. I really struggled with this episode and I feel bad because I know it was a highlight for some. Certain elements of it just left such a bad taste in my mouth that I struggled to rate it highly. Isildur apparently dying felt like so much of a nod to Aragorn taking a little tumble off the cliff in the Peter Jackson films. Book fans know he can't possibly be dead, so what's the point in creating this cliffhanger for the audience? I do think it's interesting to create this new element of grief for Elendil, but at this point, we're so far from the guidelines Tolkien left us that it just feels like, what's another thing? Not to mention Muriel being blinded by the disaster as well. Sure, Tolkien never said that Muriel and Isildur traveled to Middle-earth together and had near-death experiences, but I had also hoped until this episode that the Mithril legend would be proven false, but then the linden leaf magically transforms in Khazad Doom really sealed the coffin on that hope for me, so I wasn't super happy to see that. And then I was also really irritated when Galadriel mentions her husband out of nowhere, because at this point I had assumed they hadn't even met yet, it doesn't make sense to write Galadriel who is obsessed with avenging her brother and then doesn't once mention her husband. It was also a bit weird to me that the only person she tells about her husband is a child. So you have kind of like all of these eligible potential new husbands, Elendil, Halbrand, you know, like every other adult she speaks to all season 
no word about her husband. But then as soon as she's like talking to Theo, she's like, oh yeah, my husband. What? I'm also curious to know why they wrote Galadriel meeting Celeborn while dancing in a glade of flowers. This seems to be kind of taking an element of the story of Beren and Luthien and giving it to Galadriel. So I'm kind of wondering, are they going to give more parallels or nods to Luthien to Galadriel? That'll be kind of interesting to see. For the plot, I give this episode an eight. This episode is basically just the natural conclusion of the eruption of Mount Doom, so it's pretty easy to follow and make sense. The stranger accidentally hurting everyone all the time. Why? Um, Halbrand seemingly injuring himself to concoct a scheme to get himself to a region. Like, huh? There's also a lot of foreshadowing happening for Theo in this episode as Galadriel takes him under his wing. And I can't wait to see how that pans out in future seasons. She literally like gives him a sword, which I feel like that must be kind of significant. For dialogue, I gave this episode a seven. My favorite line, I think, was when Galadriel says, it darkens the heart to call dark deeds good. And then a funny line was when she tells Theo, rest while you can, we move at first light. And then Theo goes, what light? And that was such a like sassy teenager thing for him to say, but it was also true because the orcs literally just blotted out the sun. So I liked that moment. Durin also has a really great line when he says, the iron that must bear the most heavy burdens must also endure the most rigorous tempering. There was also a great line when the stranger is speaking to the tree and Malva and Sadek are bantering and she says, what's he muttering? And then Sadek says, likely little words, so the tree will understand. And like, I don't know, that was great. Sadek is also hilarious when he says, uh, it doesn't matter, we're all going to die. I loved the dialogue. However, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the low point for dialogue was when Largo goes, we're Harfoots with our hearts even bigger than our feet. For characterization, I give this episode a 7. Elrond and Casa Doom was a highlight, as usual. The brotherly bond between Durin IV and Elrond is really beautiful, especially when you remember that Elrond lost his brother such a long time ago. Durin III is also a standout character, and I love that he referenced Aule as well. Very cool. Elendil is such a simp for the queen. Like, he's hilarious. I love how, like, I feel like all episode he's just yelling, my queen, and, like, running off to go help her. Um, it was really cute. Galadriel's advice to Theo is really well reasoned and helpful and so it's kind of odd to hear it coming from her after she's been acting all season but I know it's easier to give advice than it is to follow it. After largely being in one storyline for episode six I know it was necessary to jump around a lot for episode seven to return to the plot lines that we had left behind and I think they did a good job but it still just wasn't my favorite. Visuals my favorite shot I had a couple I really liked the horse on fire at the beginning of the episode. It was very, very apocalyptic and cool. And I loved that there was a behind the scenes featurette that came out where they talked about they had to put like a blanket over the horse and they covered it with light. And then obviously, obviously they didn't put real fire on the horse. So they add those effects later. But it was cool seeing how it was done practically. I also felt like there's this moment when you see Volandil and he just has these this stare where you can see like there's so much grief in his heart um, and you can see them through his eyes the way that he's just kind of staring off when he has to tell Elendil that Isildur has died. The red and orange tint on everything at the beginning of the episode is really cool as it made the entire world feel very hellish. They did lose a point for the name transition to Mordor. I felt like the way it was done when I first saw the episode I was like laughing because I thought it was so cheesy. For music, of course, I gave this episode another 10. My favorite track was Infirmary. It has the themes of a lot of characters woven into it and they're all kind of presented together in this very somber way as basically everyone is reeling from the eruption. For editing, I gave this episode an 8. For editing, I gave this episode an 8. For enjoyability, I gave this episode a 4. Uh, once again, I didn't super love it. The thing with Celeborn just drove me crazy because why is she acting the way she's acting and why was she like I, you know it just doesn't make sense has her daughter been born yet it opens up so many questions that before I didn't think I had to wrestle with because I had assumed they hadn't met yet total score for episode seven was a 68 episode eight season finale alloyed episode synopsis new alliances are forged I should also say that some are broken. Episode highlights, for me, pretty clearly, the Sauron reveal was a highlight. 
been told by people like all season long that Halbrand was Sauron, but I didn't believe them up until we got to the moment where he said, call it a gift. So that was a really unforgettable moment for me. Like I could not believe my eyes and I thought it was so cool and kind of like a little preview of Anatar. So I was extremely hyped. The episode low points for me were when the stranger says, I am good. Like, I get it because Nori was teaching him that he was good, but the moment, to me, didn't land right. It felt silly. And Celebrimbor apparently not considering an alloy for the mithril was was a rough moment. But at the same time, I get it because if a handsome man wanders into your forge and is his pajamas and he's tucking his hair behind his ears and he's talking about how you're not the Celebrimbor, like, I would probably forget about what an alloy is too, so I can't really blame him. Tolkienian Corin themes, I gave this episode 14. It would seem that there are definitely other evil powers at work within Middle-earth that aren't directly related to Sauron, and that feels really Tolkienian. Everyone has to choose what path they will take. Every character has agency in their own lives and the power to shape their destiny, so that was a really good theme. However, at the end of the day, Sauron proposing to Galadriel, however non-romantic it may have been, is just not something that happens within Tolkien's framework. So even though I absolutely loved it and I went completely bananas for that scene, I can still understand how it might be a little jarring for book nerds because at the end of the day, this is this is McPain's own story. This is not a direct adaptation of the books. They're taking the themes and they're working with those. But like at the end of the day, Sauron's not proposing to Galadriel. I wish he was, though. I also felt the death of Tar Palantir was a really good way to explain Numenor's fear of death. Um, And it was a good start, but I think they could have done more to emphasize it. And I hope they'll kind of continue along with it in seasons to come. For a plot, I give this episode a 10. The stranger's plotline wrapping up with him discovering a little bit more about who he is and where he needs to go was nice, despite the Sauron fake out. Finally getting Sauron to Oregion was one of the highlights of the season. He immediately gets to work with Celebrimbor in the most subtle way, um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing more of that. For dialogue, I gave this episode an 8. My favorite line, you can probably guess, I have been awake since before the breaking of the first silence. In that time, I have had many names. Just like whoever wrote that line, I could just give them a hug. Celebrimbor also says something earlier in the episode. The sun itself began as something no bigger than the palm of my hand. Though I'm always here for a Silmaril or, you know, a Valinor reference. Then I also really enjoyed Gil Galad's line when he says, perilous are these whisperings. I feel like even though he kind of comes across as very, not very, but a little bit flat, he is a good king. He wants to do his right. He immediately is like, you guys want to make a crown for one person with all this power? That's a bad idea. So I liked that. For characterization, I give this episode an 8. Galadriel's desire for power is equated too much with her desire for Sauron. Well, okay, she doesn't desire Sauron, but she definitely has her little cosmic connection with Halbrand. So I think they probably chose the simplest route to kind of connect her desire for something abstract and making it and trying to make it a little concrete by kind of personifying it. It ended up a little too simplified, I think. Elrond having to apologize for not trusting Galadriel, only for her to like turn around and deceive him immediately, was rough. They're going to have some issues in season two. Sauron playing to Celebrimbor's ambition and pride was great. And I loved the way that Celebrimbor almost immediately name drops Feanor. Super good characterization here. Aarian being left with the Palantir at the end of the season was an interesting direction for her character. I'm excited to see where she ends up in season two. Hopefully she's going to be very evil. Gilgalad being resistant to the idea of forging a crown was good, like I just said. For pacing, I gave this episode 10. Uh, the scene with a stranger at the beginning, we started out going like 60 miles per hour. Some of the other episodes started out a little slower, but I liked how it was very clear, like, this is the finale. and We've got a lot to cover. However, I feel like the forging of the three was rushed. It felt somehow shorter than the Harfoot goodbye hugging scene, which irritated me, as you know. For visuals, I gave this episode a 10. My favorite shot, of course, is Sauron's vision on the raft. What an epic moment. Like, that should be printed on t-shirts and stuff. 
The shot of Celebrimbor with the chain across his neck, though, was probably the coolest, very subtle moment of foreshadowing that a lot of people didn't pick up on. And then I also loved the Garden of Eden imagery in Eregium. For music, once again, a 10. My favorite track was True Creation Requires Sacrifice. Editing, 10. No notes, really. Um, and then for enjoyability, a 10. This season definitely left a lot of questions unanswered, which two years ago was horrible. But now that we're kind of on the cusp of season two, I, I find it more manageable. Hopefully many of these questions will be answered, but I do think it answered enough to, you know, mostly be satisfying. Total score for this episode was a 90. So let's look back on season one as a whole. Here are my episode scores for each episode. Episode 1, 73. Episode 2, 79. Episode 3, 84. Episode 4, 87. Episode 5, 70. Episode 6, 95. Episode 7, 68. And episode 8 is 90. Let's also look at it broken down by category. So I added up the category points for each episode and totaled them up. For Tolkienian core and themes, this episode got a 101 out of 160, which is a 63%. For plot, we got a 57 out of 80, 71%. Dialogue, 62 out of 80, 78%. Characterization, 63 out of 80, 79%. Pacing, 70 out of 80, 87%. Visuals, 74 out of 80, 93%. Music, 80 out of 80, 100%. Thank you, Bear McCreary. Editing, 72 out of 80, 90%. Enjoyability, 61 out of 80 for 76%. So kind of adding everything together, the season one final grade was an 80.75%. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty fair grade. I'm kind of interested to hear how others would compare. I feel like when I initially reviewed the season, I gave it a bit of a lower grade, but I was actually kind of surprised when I went back and did it more methodically how the grade seemed to improve a bit. And it also might have just been the passage of time, and I've had more time to think about this series. Overall, I do feel that this season laid a good foundation for the future seasons to come. Without spoiling anything for season two, I can already see the seeds planted in season one beginning to bloom, which is exciting. The show was at its weakest, in my opinion, when it tried too hard to remind viewers of the Peter Jackson films. There were just way too many callbacks that ended up feeling cheap or missing the mark. I also felt a lot of the plot just ended up leaving me with too many questions. Probably, this is probably the result of cutting the season down from 10 episodes to eight. But, you know, some things just plain didn't make sense. I also feel awful because I love The Hobbits, but I'm just not a fan of the Harfoot storyline. Despite everyone in the whole production doing such an amazing job, like I really have a lot of respect for the actors, the costuming, story, dialogue, set. It's all outstanding, but it's just, I don't know, personally, they just, I didn't like them. My kids love them, though. So honestly, like I'm happy that they're a part of the show, even though they aren't my favorite, because that's the thing about a show with so many different types of characters that one aspect is going to speak to another fan and you know it might not be my cup of tea but it's going to be someone else's cup of tea and then we can kind of all come together and enjoy the story together <laughs> so probably the most ironic thing to come out of this series for myself personally is that I've discovered what shipping is and it was funny because I had no idea what that was until there was this interview that came out where Morveth Clark who plays Galadriel is actually having to explain to Charlie Vickers who plays Sauron what shipping is and it was like as I was watching that video that I also learned what shipping is. And unfortunately, I'm like completely enamored with this whole Sauron Galadriel thing. I think the way they chose to write these two characters as the representations of light and darkness and then throw them into situations together was very clever and honestly beautiful because it spoke to a lot of Tolkien's themes about hope versus despair. I definitely don't think Tolkien would be happy to hear about how much I love the idea that the two of them are these like cosmically bound soulmates, doomed soulmates maybe. But at the end of the day, like this is fiction. I'm having a lot of fun with it. So whatever. I also loved Sauron's characterization as Halbrand, and I'm kind of sad to, to say goodbye to it. The ambiguity at play here speaks to this attempted repentance at the beginning of the Second Age, and the tragedy of Sauron's character was communicated really well this way. 
we've had a lot of time to properly mourn for all of the lost goodness of Myron, which is kind of the being that Sauron once was. And now we're going to get into him behaving quite badly as Anatar. I think the way that Sauron disguised himself as a low man gave him this opportunity that Sauron probably never had in the books to be vulnerable and known without the baggage that surrounds his true identity, not only as a Maya, but as a very evil Maya. So I think it's so interesting. It's almost like we got Halbrand as this little thought experiment. Like, what would Sauron do if he were in the situation that Tolkien didn't really write? But let's follow this thought. I feel as if a lot of his conversations throughout the season were really genuine despite the mask because of the fact that nobody knew who he really was. So I'm really going to miss that moving into season two. Like, I'm really going to miss Halbrand and the idea of that. Anyways, this video has been super duper long. So let's wrap up. As we're less than two days away from the season two now, I'm definitely feeling a good sense of closure now that I've gotten all of this recorded. And I'm excited to move on into diving in and discussing season two. So I hope you enjoyed this recap. I'm sure you'll disagree with me in, in areas. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on season one. How would you rate it if you kind of followed a similar scoring structure? If you'd like to continue the discussion, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram or Discord. Pretty much anywhere. Um, you can go to teawithtolkien.com slash Discord to learn more about our free Discord server. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing or telling a friend about Tea with Tolkien.